Life can be tough. We often find ourselves juggling between two worlds, Deen and Dunya, this world and the next. From career ambitions and marriage goals to daily routines and traveling the spiritual path. How does Islam address these issues and how do we know when we have achieved the balance? To help us answer these questions and more is Sheikh Naveed Aziz, a native of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, a youth counsellor and someone who has lectured across five continents and over 20 countries. But today, you can find him with his team at Al Maghrib Institute. Enjoy the podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh Naveed. It's an honor to have you here again. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's an honor and pleasure to be here again. Sheikh, I think you are actually our first Canadian guest here. I may be wrong, but I think Allah you are the first. I think you are. I think Allah so Allah you have to establish that, inshallah, more people from Canada. Inshallah. Will come, inshallah. May Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. Uh, actually, has Sheikh Yahya been here? Sheikh, Sheikh Yahya has. He, came he has, but not on the podcast. Not, not on, on the podcast. podcast. Okay. But he's Australian now. You can't yeah, yeah. That, that's true. That's true. He's, he's sold out. He's one of us. He's one of us. Yeah. Mashallah. Have you been to Canada, Kamal? Never. 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 You never I, I know Canada's beautiful. You've though. never experienced a Tim Hortons in your life. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make that happen, inshallah. Look, is, is that coffee? I Tim Hortons coffee. is coffee. You have to have but, a Tim Hortons. Yeah, but uh, to be fair, I don't think Canadians will be able to even come close to Australian coffee. Not even close. That's yeah, why like, yeah, exactly. I, I don't even Proof. drink Tim Hortons. Yeah. I do not well, drink Tim Hortons. Okay, I don't know. I mean, I really <laughs> beat, I really beat Canada once. I'm sorry, fellow Canadians. Mm. Tim Hortons really is more about the nostalgia. Like people it grew is. up on it okay. and that's why it's so famous. But in terms of actually quality products, no? you know, I don't know if they'll sue us for this, but it's not that good. You guys got poutine though. We don't have that, poutine. That's true. But yeah, you also see the difference in obesity rates there as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Have you had Australian coffee? I just did. I just did just before mm, I arrived. Nice, nice. And it's without a shadow of a doubt, some of the best coffee I've ever had. Wow. Yeah. Without, without a shadow of the doubt, Allah Australian Allah. coffee is one of the best, I would say the best in the world. Alhamdulillah. But Sydney, I, I, I need to ask you between Melbourne coffee and Sydney coffee. All right, okay. We wins? take the L. We take the L. Melbourne is definitely better. Okay. We'll, we'll cut that Melbourne's, out, inshallah. No, maybe no, just uh, we'll take the L. Sydney will take the L, but I think it's it's well known. So, um, so I've been told that Sydney will take the L in two spaces: in their road design and structure, yeah. and then in their coffee. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. No, no. I, mean, I think no. I think Melbourne's got Melbourne's a bit weird when it comes to their road structure. They turn right from like. The Cook Lane. The <laughs> it's, it's a bit weird. It doesn't I don't make know any what sense. Melbourne's doing. We right drive on the left side of the road. Uh-huh. You guys drive on, on the right. right. Yeah. Yeah. On the right so side. we got that wrong, but Chala, we'll take the L for that as well. Inshallah. Uh, America, Canada. You, you brought it up, Malik. What's the big deal? Like, is is there more like is there beef between Canadians and Americans? I know, I know there no. is a little bit. Canada is like the America's America. stooge. Canada's oh, America's wow. stooge. Wow, <laughs> like, wow, wow. Even though technically we're under the Queen, mm. but politically, whatever America has said, Canada has followed. Oh, so. under the King, I should say. Actually, now, now the King. Yes, yeah. that is true. But the money currency hasn't changed yet. Okay, so, neither has. Yeah, yeah. So technically, we're still under the Queen till they managed uh, to change that. Sure. Any beef yeah. between Canadian imams and American imams or? That's all love. It's all about no, love, it's man. All love, man. Oh, yeah, it's sure? all love, alhamdulillah. Oh, we can confirm part. that. We can yeah, confirm yeah, that. Yeah, from 100%. Sheikh Naved, there's there's love. love. So, Sheikh, to begin today's topic, I think the topic we've chosen is a topic which is, I guess we can say it's a little bit generic, but at the same time, it can be very confusing mm. to a lot of people, myself included. And that is balancing between the deen and the dunya, dunya. balancing between your, I guess, your religious life. And your worldly life and your worldly pursuits. Mm-hmm. The first question we'll have is how does a Muslim living in the West or wherever he may be living, how does he find out what is his place in the dunya? And I know there's an easy answer to that question. You know, we were all created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I want to go into the intricate details. How do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you in this dunya? Allahu Akbar. You know, um, I think this is a very personal question to me in the sense, because I'll give you some background. Ever since I graduated from Medina. um, What year was that? 2008. Mm. Oh, well. So December 2008, I came back to Canada. And in March 2009, um, I attended this program with Sheikh Mohammed al-Sharif, rahimahullah. Rahimahullah. With regards to life coaching and certification and stuff like that. And I attended it because he gave me the advice that if you can't figure out what you want to do in life, come and attend this and you'll try to figure it out. So I was like, okay, bismillah, let's do it. Because no joke, like I used to cry at night 
Like in the middle of the night, I'd be crying because I felt there was this void in my heart that I didn't know what I wanted to do. Because my whole life I was told, don't become an imam, they'll treat you terribly. But those are the only opportunities that are open to me. So someone what am I? Who's just graduated. Yeah, someone that's just graduated. So what am I meant to do, right? So I attended this program, and Alhamdulillah, I think it was it was life changing without a shadow of a doubt. Because a lot of the topics that we'll discuss today, I think my foundation came from that very event in March 2009 with Sheikh Muhammad Rahimahullah. But all that to say, for my whole entire life up until this point, I would say December of 2022, I always kept looking at I want to be from those people that have clarity and purpose and are passion driven through their career. That I understand this concept of we're created to worship Allah, but you also have, can I use my career as a way of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As a means of self-fulfillment. Exactly, as a means of self-fulfillment. And I struggled with this. And I, like, from an Islamic perspective, I used to have ghibta as opposed to hasad. So ghibta is when you see someone with something good and you want for them and for yourself as well. Mm, that's fine. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. You say, Allahumma barik lahum, you know, may Allah bless it for them and may, may I have the same, right? Hasid is like you want to take it away from them and you want it for yourself. That's haram. That's what you're not allowed to have. And I used to have this ghibta. And you, you know, I, I, I look at these examples of people that have, you know, one career for their whole entire lives. And they've taken it to the, you know, uh, epitome of what anyone can reach in that field. And I'd be like, I want that, man. Why can't I have that? Subhanallah. Till December of 2022, I came to this epiphany that, you know what? It's okay to be the jack of all trades because mm. I've dealt with Islamic finance. I've dealt with mental health. I've dealt with counseling in sure. general. I've dealt with the comedy and spoken word tours. Mm. Like I've done all this stuff, right? Trying to find what is my niche that I meant to fulfill. And then I came to two realizations. Number one, that it's okay to be the jack of all trades. Have your hand in a in the little bit of everything. And this too is also a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that too is a blessing because certain people wish that they could expand their horizons and have multiple you know, skill sets. And if that's what Allah has given you, alhamdulillah. And then number two, as you grow, there are certain things in your life that will no longer be relevant, that you've outgrown them, right? And that is where your purpose and your passion and your fulfillment will be in different things as you grow older. And, you move. and that too is fine as well. So, you know, someone that's in Islamic finance now, 10 years from now, they don't have to be in that. They can go into some other career, right? So I think leave those doors open that some people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives clarity and embrace it. Other people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give clarity to, but you have to embrace that as well. Because if you don't embrace it, then you end up going down the trajectory that I had where you're constantly just like punishing yourself internally. Why can't I have the clarity? Why can't I have the clarity? SubhanAllah, right? And you have to embrace it and you move on with it. And that's where you slowly and gradually develop multiple skill sets at the same time. What were some of the learnings from Sheikh Muhammad Sharif, if you don't mind me asking? So, so you said that did take a bit of a, a tangent when, yeah. you, when you went to that class. What were some of the learnings you, I guess, gained from that specific class? So there was actually two classes happening. So on the weekend, we did this class called The Millionaire That Went to Jannah. And that's like uh, an approach to Islamic finance and how Muslims view wealth. And then the second one was how to deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis. So how to build rapport with them, you know, um, how to speak the same language as them, how to, you know, for lack of a better word, manipulate emotions to get them to a place where they need, need to, to be, be yeah. right? So that's uh, what the class was about. Mm. Yeah. Sheikh, that was actually a very beautiful story. And I think that actually could relate to a lot of people in the sense that life is actually quite a, a long journey. And mashallah, you know, roller coaster, it, a roller coaster, of course, and a roller coaster of emotions and overwhelming feelings. But you don't have to, I don't feel like sometimes a lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves. Uh, perhaps even at a certain age that I need to achieve X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, I mean, for example, prophethood was revealed at, I think it's 40, 40, at 40, 40 subhanAllah. Yeah. So, you know, you, life is a long journey with so many blessings. But um, I would want to ask you, what would be on the other side of that spectrum? Because you're saying like, we live in a world where people are, you know, the clock is ticking fast and people have got to, make some money moves, you know, time is hard, there's recession in some places, things are quite not as, they're not as easy as they were maybe five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but what would be the extremes? Like what would be a pitfall, for example, um, if you're just chasing certain things um, like a career, uh, whether that be financial wealth, which is okay to an extent, as you were saying, but what would be the opposite of that, of going into extremes? What would be so I, I think if we put the spectrum from one side to the other, one side is, you know what? I'm just gonna live in the masjid and stay in the masjid and everything I do is a, a form of uh, Islamic monasticism, which is not actually Islamic at all. 
the Prophet Sallallahu he tells us that the best wealth that you can earn is the wealth that you earn with your own two hands, right? Mm -hmm. And he gives us the example of the bird that if you were to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trust that he's truly deserving, then he would provide for you just like he provides for the bird that leaves its nest early in the morning hungry and comes back with its stomach full. So you have to take that action to earn your rizq. So that is one side of the spectrum where you completely ignore, ignore the dunya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with this. He tells us, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا That don't forget about your share of this world. So that monastic you know, lifestyle is not Islamic at all. And then you have the exact opposite side where people are just living for the sake of this dunya. Get rich by any means necessary, right? What was that uh, famous 50 cent line? Get rich get or die, die Get rich or die trying. I learned that, uh, I don't know where I learned that from, but um, <laughs> Jadis. I don't know. Jadis. Jadis. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I can quote, no, nothing. No worries, yeah. all good, alhamdulillah. So yeah, and that's the exact opposite end. And this is where, you know, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that whoever prioritizes their akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them their akhirah and their dunya. But whoever mm -hmm. prioritizes their dunya mm -hmm. ends up losing both. And so, that's like something you really fear, subhanAllah that how many of these people are chasing the dunya, but they're miserable on the inside. And I think we've seen so many examples of this, you know, in uh, pop culture, where they have the house, they have the car, they have the money, they have the promiscuous lifestyle, yet these people end up committing suicide at the end. Mm. No, that's very true, Sheikh. I think, like you said, there are many examples today that people can uh, take notice of. But I would ask, you know, this is a really weird concept. And maybe I'm gonna throw this question to both of you, and this is gonna be a bit weird. But I want you just to have a, maybe have a second and reflect of the answer. Because I've done this to a couple of people and I've got the most funniest of answers here, but mm -hmm. this is something that I found really astounding. And I don't think no one's actually answered it correctly the first time. So maybe you guys at home could have a listen and tune in. What do all men want? It's one thing. And I'm going to throw that out there. Anyone can start if you have an answer. Bismillah. Come on, go for it, man. All right, we'll save the best for last. Um, what do all men want? I can only speak for myself. I can't speak on behalf okay. of all men. I don't like people projecting all men. I'm joking. Um, what do men want from my perspective? Contentment. Contentment? Okay. Peace. Good. A, a you, so you're speaking specifically about men. For men, yeah. For men, as opposed to mankind, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, from what I understand, men are, are recognition driven. They want recognition. They want praise. They want to be the man, right? Yeah. Interesting. Recognition. The answer that I came to, or that I've heard as well, that's been speculating, is more. Men want more. Mm. And there's having the issue of contentment. Like the I, Prophet, I think all people want more. Well, I think men and women are a bit different in that regard. But the Prophet Islam said, you know, if you were to give uh, a man a land of gold, mm. what would you want? Another. Another. Yeah. Of gold. Yeah. Right? So I think, I think that was just a, an interesting thing I wanted uh, to throw into the works. I, I think that that's actually very interesting because we can lead on to the next topic. So man always wants more. Mm -hmm. And in that hadith, I believe the Prophet Sallallahu says, and nothing will fulfill his belly except dust, right. dirt, turab. And on saying that, we can see that this dunya in many ahadith, in many of the literature, Islamic literature, we see that this dunya is somewhat cursed. Mm -hmm. you know, there's actually a hadith that says, Ad -dunya mm -hmm. yeah. It's a place that has been cursed and except for aliman or mutalim, except for a scholar, a student of knowledge and the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We see all this, I guess, dispraise and criticism of the dunya. Mm -hmm. But then at the other t on the other hand, at least as a Muslim, I see that this dunya is also a beautiful place. Like it's a place of joy. It's a place of family. It's a place of gathering. It's a place of brotherhood. Mm -hmm. It's a place of uh, even charity, doing good works. So how do you balance between this dunya being a place that is, for lack of a bit of terms, or f for what the hadith mentions, mm -hmm. a place that is cursed, mm -hmm. But then at the same time, it's a place of great beauty. Mm -hmm. of course. An amphitheater of light, if you so will. An amphitheater, An amphitheater of, of, of light. light. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> MashaAllah. Very great. Uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that very concept in Surah Al-Kahf. Al-Malu wal banun zinatul hayat al-dunya. That mm -hmm. wealth and children are from the adornments of this life. Mm -hmm. And I think there's two approaches over here. Number one is that here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that they are from adornments, your wealth and children. So you are meant to embrace them, you are meant to enjoy them. Like people may think that if I have wealth and children, I'm supposed to curse it and hate it no, and you know, yeah, that sort of mentality, right? Because I, I don't want it to distract me from the, from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll get to that point as well. And then number two is that if you look at this word zina, zina is a, a very surface level beauty. So it's beautiful on the surface, but deep down inside, it could be beautiful or it could be ugly, right? It can go both ways. It can go both ways. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's beautiful or ugly underneath. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gives us this other perspective where wa fitna, that indeed your wealth and your children are a fitna for you. So be very careful as to how you tread with them. But what I want to focus on is this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعَ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ That on that day, your wealth and your children will not benefit you except for the one that comes to Allah with a pure heart. Allah. That's right? A, that's a crazy connection. Yes. And that's what we want to focus on, that how do we get to this level where our wealth and our children will benefit us? And that focuses on having a pure heart, right? So the example I like to give, and this is not my example, this is from Sheikh Muhammad, rahimahullah, is that wealth is like a magnifying glass in the sense that if the heart is pure, it will magnify the purity. If the heart is corrupt, may Allah protect us from that, it will magnify the corruption. What does that mean? That if your heart is pure, you're very conscious as to where your money is coming from and how you're spending it. If the heart is corrupt, you won't care where your money is coming from and you won't care how you're spending it, right? So if your heart is pure, your wealth and your children will be a proof for you. But if your heart is corrupt, your wealth and children will be a proof against you, right? So if you focus on your own self and the purifying your heart and doing righteous deeds and consciously you know, working at uh, eradicating greed and miserliness and all these other diseases that are related to wealth, that is how you make your wealth a, a proof for you, right? And that's what I think people often forget that there is a physical dimension to wealth. And I think that's something we need to explore as well. But there's a spiritual dimension to wealth, right? Like the sins become an impediment between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet tells us in Sahih Muslim that there's a man that's traveling in the desert, his hair is disheveled, he's dusty, he's hungry, he's thirsty, and he raises his hands to Allah. And then he tells us about this man that his eating is from haram, his drinking is from haram, his clothes are from haram, his wealth is from haram. Why does he think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer his dua? Meaning that if you're not conscious of the things that you consume, then they can become an impediment between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's that spiritual dimension of risk being prevented as opposed to with, the, with your sins. But then we have the opposite end uh, in, in Surah An-Nuh where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَقُلْ تَسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا That Nuh alayhi salam, he tells his people that regularly make istighfar because he is the one that sends clouds through which the rains comes down. He is the one that blesses you with wealth and children. And he is the one that will grant you uh, gardens underneath which rivers flow. Meaning that the more istighfar you make, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with these things, right? So that spiritual dimension of wealth is very, very important. And then you find instances where the Prophet ﷺ is actually asking for rizq, right? Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'a wa rizqan tayyiba wa amalan mutaqabbala. That's one dua that we learn. And then the one of the duas that's narrated after wudu, is that the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Allahumma ghfir li dhanbi wa wasi' li fi dari wa barik li fi rizqi. That, oh Allah, forgive me for my sin, make spacious for me my home, and bless for me my rizq. So I think as believers, we have to take the physical means, and a sign of purity is that you're taking the spiritual means as well. And that's mm -hmm. what keeps you in check. Because if you're not taking the spiritual means, you'll go to, you know, get rich or die trying. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to live that lifestyle. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to carry off. Come yeah, I apologize. I came across as a lecture that wasn't my no, intention no, 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 at all. No, that's all good. Oh, yeah. I think what you said was actually very pertinent, very important for us to hear. I think there was someone who mentioned before, um, he said, you know, I think this goes back to what you were saying about if you're not having these means as a means of benefit, but to know that everything that sits above dust is only dust itself. Mm. And if you really actualize that, I think it's incredibly deep that if you're not using these things for means of benefit, then what? What are they? Just material things. Yeah. But I think there was actually a really funny story that we actually had a marriage counselor that came in um, that we had the pleasure to listen to some time ago. And they were telling us how there was this husband and wife, mashallah, the guy was actually quite wealthy, but his wife was saying he just doesn't give in charity. He doesn't give. Mm. And it got to such a point where the marriage counselor actually had to come in and hold the man's hand to um, donate money in. So he would physically hold his hand, put money in to tip in the box, in the charity box. And then every week the wife would call uh, the counselor saying, look, he's not doing it, he's not doing it. And he would have to come time and time again to actually, you know, to do the same thing over and over again. But by the end of it, I think there was, as far as I think there was nearly about $100,000 in that thing. And what it was, it wasn't just coins anymore. It was $50 notes, $100 notes. So subhanAllah, it's quite expensive. He trained himself how to part with the mm -hmm. dunya. And I think 
that can also allude to the importance of having the dunya in your hand, but not in your heart. Mm-hmm. So being able to possess it's a big difference, great amounts yeah. of wealth, but at the same time, your heart is con- Allah subhanahu wa taala is contained within your heart, and the love of Allah and the love of the Deen is within your heart. But within your hand, you own this dunya. How does one know that the dunya is in his heart and not in his hand? What are the uh, signs? Not in his heart. The the dunya is not in his heart, but only in his hands. What are the, what are the signs? Because we are people naturally. We love to look good. We love to dress nice. We love to, you know, wear the nicest shoes, nicest clothes. How do we know that this is only, you know, what manifests physically, but within my heart, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I was going to jump the gun. I was yeah. going to answer that before you even asked. Uh, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he was asked, what is zuhud? Like, what is asceticism? Mm. And he says that if you got 100,000 dinars or you lost 100,000 dinars, you will not increase or decrease in your shukr. Allah. All right? And I think that's how you know that if your wealth goes up or your wealth goes down, you're not necessarily more happy or sad just based but upon that Naturally, wealth. I think you are going to be sad if you lose $100,000. I, I would be very sad. <laughs> oh, of course. Be, but I mean, the fact that you got $200,000 in the first place. If I saw $100,000. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that and I mean, much, much more I mean. in this life and the next. I mean. I mean, right? But the point is, like, you know, I, I, I think about this regularly. The one that granted you the tawfiq to get $200,000 the first time, can he not grant you the tawfiq to reach it a second time and a third time, right? And I think that's the, the life of this dunya, that if you look at Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, like the more money he gave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him like tenfold, fortyfold, seventyfold more, right? And that's the concept of having wealth in your hand and not in your heart, that you're willing to let it go, understanding that I'm giving this away and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give me much, much more. The second thing to look at is, again, you know, the Prophet is telling us, um, al-ghina, ghina, nafs, that wealth is not the, the, the physical possessions that you have, but it is the contentment of the soul. So if your soul is content, does it make a difference if you have 100,000 or if you have no money at all? No, because everyone just wants to have contentment in their life. So What is contentment? What is contentment? It is, you know, it ties in to the submission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is best for me and I don't. That is what contentment is, right? Al-Islamu al-Istislam. That Islam is to submit to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that is what contentment is. And if a person can force themselves into submission that Allah knows better for me than I do know for myself, you will always be content. But the second you become deluded into thinking that I know better than what Allah knows for me and wants for me, then you'll be miserable your whole entire life. I read, a, I think it was a statement of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. He says, I do not ask Allah to make me rich or poor because I do not know which one is better mm. for me. So just to have that state of contentment regardless of your outer circumstances and to always, what, what was interesting about what you said as well, uh, you did not in Increase or decrease in shukr. Mm. So you always remain as a thankful slave of Allah. And even in like modern psychology today, that they say that we should all practice gratitude and gratitude is so great for you. And yeah. you should always be thankful. And all these but what, what I guess uh, bewilders me mm. is how can you practice gratitude as someone who doesn't believe in Allah? Without like, giving thanks I, unto the one. Yeah, like I, yeah. I see a lot of people saying, you know, when I buy a cup of coffee, I manifest my $5 it. And, and, I, and I put it in my heart that, oh, I'm grateful. But who are you grateful to? Like to to Mother Nate, no, you, you, who are you grateful to? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That makes the difference for me. 100%. And this is why, you know, at the end of the day, this is how secularism has ruined our societies mm-hmm. in the sense where it's taboo to thank and praise God, but it's completely even f- normal and fine to thank Mother Earth and Mother <laughs> <Yeah>. Nature <laughs> and the universe. And that's, that's thank a new the thing. Universe. I thank the aligned. universe, right? Yeah. Exactly. The stars have aligned. At the end of the day, as if these things aren't created themselves, right? You know, subhanAllah, how can you thank something that's created just like you are? Um, but that's what secularism has done to us, right? It's mentioning taboo has become a, a pejorative almost. Yeah, to, to thank yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they know deep down, you know, practicing gratitude is is only helping you and only benefiting you. And it's, of course. it's proven in the Quran. Yeah. Uh, if you practice gratitude, you'll surely be increased. And we've seen it psychologically, biologically. It's it's proven as a strategy to increase oneself. You've also mentioned on secularism. And this is another topic that we were actually thinking needs to be touched upon. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Muslims today living in the West, 
the way we are, I guess, programmed in this world is to go through the secular channels of attaining knowledge and uh, going to universities, going to colleges, attaining degrees. Um, and me personally, whenever like a year 12 student or someone who's finishing high school comes to me and asks me for advice, in my humble advice, I generally tell them, pick a degree where you can become a person of benefit. benefit yeah. To give so, back. Yeah, to give back. There's a, there's a famous hadith, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْفَعَهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The most beloved people to Allah are those who are most beneficial. And at times when you're an imam, it just seems so, I guess, apparent. I'm an imam, I'm going to benefit my community by working in X, the masajid. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not everyone's going to be an imam. Correct. There are different channels of, of knowledge. Someone becomes a doctor, someone becomes an engineer. Yeah, the different avenues. Yeah. I think that's really important. We can be, uh, we need Muslims yeah. in all spaces, I would argue. So, so, so yeah. the question is, how do you know how to use your degree to become a pe mm -hmm. person of benefit? Yeah, yeah, I would agree. So how, how could we, what, what advice would you give to someone, perhaps someone as young as myself, um, or to someone who's perhaps doing university or... What would your advice be for someone to be a, a real student of knowledge, but yet still engage and in this world, but, but to study something that will be of a means of benefit? Mm. What would you advise them? So I, I think there's a, quite a bit to unpack in that question as well. With regards to being a student of knowledge, like always study with your local scholars, start with memorizing the Quran as much as you can, and then learn the fundamentals of your, your deen, right? Like every Muslim needs to know those basics. So make sure you know those basics in terms of your Islam. Now, with regards to your degree and your education, statistically, I can't remember, but it's between 60 to 70% of people that graduate with a degree don't actually work in the profession that they graduated in. That's right? entirely natural, right? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. normal and fine. And I think this goes back to allowing yourself that behavioral flexibility that even though I'm graduating in geology, if I end up working in customer service, that's perfectly fine, right? Geology. So, uh, as in I'm throwing random stuff out amazing. there, right? Oh, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> So the, the point being at the end of the day, there's two things to look at. Number one, financially contributing to the ummah and uh, using your skill set to contribute to the ummah. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah hashtara minal mu'minina anfusam wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purchased from the believers their wealth and their souls in exchange for jannah. So the wealth part is obvious and the soul part will equate to using your skill set to benefit the ummah. So with regards to your wealth, this is not just about you paying your zakat. Like zakat is mandatory. Mm -hmm. And this is like if you the go- The bare minimum. The bare minimum, like praying five times a day is the bare minimum, right? So you wanna go above and beyond and try to use your wealth strategically. Uh, like I'm a big proponent of coming back to this waqf system where you create a waqf where even after you pass away, you know, people continue to benefit from your wealth. Um, so using your wealth, but then also using your skill set. Like someone that's good at graphic design, someone that's good at customer service, someone that's good at, uh, you know, math. Whatever you can do to help and benefit the ummah, just like you give your zakat on your wealth and your sadaqah on your wealth, you have to give zakat and sadaqah on, on the knowledge that you have and as the well. Skills that you on have. the skills that you have as well, right? So contributing those to the, to the masjid or community organizations. Because I think historically all we had was masajid and government like everything was run under the khilafah system but now that that's not the case you have masajid and you have community organizations and you can see where your skill set fits in the most right so find one of those organizations that you feel comfortable working with and contribute your skill set as well and if you don't find one perhaps create that society as well because some i mean we live like the opposite side of the world, we're here in Australia and in some remote places, there's not much, there's not really a sense of community. So I think a word to the audience or to whoever is listening, definitely try and build those circles. I mean, to have good companionship, it's so important. And to have a good stable community, it's 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 really important. And, and find what you can contribute. It was just yesterday, I was watching this random video that popped up in my feed of an Egyptian architect who was uh, asked to design the Haramain in Allah Medina Allah. and Mecca. Wow. Allah you, Allah. You're an architect. You're not a student of knowledge. You're not a scholar. You're not a uh, talib al ilm. You're not a da'i. You're an architect and an yeah. engineer. And for him, that was like the most, I guess, honorable feat he could ever achieve in his life. And I heard that he gave away all the money he earned from uh, designing the Haramain Allah and Allah expanding Allah. the Haramain. So, look, an architect can find his way to contribute back to society. So, wherever you are, just try to find that, 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 place in your life to to give back subhanallah yeah and um it can be tough 
I mean, for example, we have, you also do have family commitments as well, right? So yeah. that's tough. Sheikh, would you have any advice for perhaps any young couples out there of who are trying to, still trying to engage, but also have obligations at the home? What would your advice be to perhaps a young married couple or a couple, let's say, a so married couple? I, I, I think when you get married, finding the right spouse is mm -hmm. paramount, right? So it's paramount in the sense that your values have to be aligned in the sense that you have to be Akhira driven. So that being said, you know, um, don't quote me on, on the authenticity of this, but the scholars of Hadith have mentioned this story of uh, al baqi ibn Makhlad, who was one of the students of Imam Ahmad, and he made two journeys in his lifetime. One was approximately 20 years long and another one was like 30 or 40 years long. And they asked him, you know, how do you spend so much time away from your family. Like, mm. Can you imagine being away for 20 years? Mm. Like this is pre-internet, right? This is, <laughs> if you're, anything, you're writing, you're, you're you're writing letters, if anything, yeah. right? But his response was phenomenal. It's a small amount of time to be away from them in this dunya, to be with them forever in Jannah, right? So if they recognize the fact that what I'm doing is akhirah driven, and yes, I may not get to spend all the time that you want with me uh, in this life, but if you're willing to be patient just long enough so that we can get to Jannah together, I will be with in, with you in Jannah for infinity, inshallah, right? A tremendous sacrifice on the part of his family as exactly, well. Exactly, right? And th these are like, you know, we don't understand the the the, the shoulders of the giants of, of who we stand upon, right? Like Baqi ibn Makhlad to us is probably some no one. I, I doubt, well, the vast majority of our audience has, has heard of him. But if you look at the hadith that are narrated, like he was a major contributor to the science of hadith. So all of that's to say that, you know, when you're finding a spouse, someone that's akhira driven, number two, openly communicate and support and encourage one another, right? I think that's something that isn't done enough. Oftentimes we don't communicate and we don't encourage one another, right? What is what tawasul bil haq, what tawasul bil sabr all about, right? There's a divine wisdom behind why this is such a short surah that almost everyone has memorized, but this is how you get through the dunya. You keep advising with one another to be patient and you keep advising of one another with the truth. Right, that truth is Allah, and through Allah you will get to, to Jannah. Right, then the the third and last thing is I think oftentimes we don't include our families enough in our pursuits, so we do things in isolation. You take care of, of the, the home house. and the kids, and I will take care of you know the outside world and dawah and everything else. But if there's a way that you can include them, I think they'll appreciate that so much more. Mm. Right. So those are our three points that I would recommend for those newly mm. wedded really couples. Funny. I'm also doing the small things like there's a <laughs> there's a joke that my father would tell me and he would recall this joke. He would say, you know, at night, uh, for example, the husband may go to the wife and say, honey, I've, I've brought you like a, for example, a really nice gift. Maybe it may be um, a ring, a piece of jewelry or even a car. And then the wife goes to bed at night and says, if only he knew the way to my heart was doing the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's a, that's it's a, a way to a yeah. lot of women's hearts. Acts of service. And the, the, the thing is, it's not as if she wants you to do the dishes every single night. Yeah. She just wants to know that you care enough to do it one night yeah. without her having to ask, yeah. right? So I think being proactive from all the time, but even sometimes if possible, will go such a long way in terms of uh, being appreciation, uh, being appreciated. Marriage is, is definitely a very important topic, but to avoid going into the marriage lizard hole. Bismillah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go back out just for a moment. Um, we spoke about career pursuits and, you know, making sure that you're a person of benefit. But there are times when we feel like our dean sometimes suppresses our career pursuits. And I wanted to mention, a, I, I think it's a very interesting story about the first Muslim to go to space. Mm. He was one of the sons of the current king of, of the Saudi Arabian kingdom, Malik, Malik Salman. Man. He was the first Muslim to go to space. And he had a, his name was Sultan bin Salman. And he was asked to bring only one personal item to space that he was allowed to take with him. And he chose to take the Quran. Mm. And he, he, it's documented and he speaks about it on, on a video that was recorded about this incident. And he said, I was doing khatam of the Qur'an in space. He was, I was reading the Qur'an and I was, you know, from cover to cover in space. I was praying my salah in space. I was praying tahajjud in space. And he says, I want Muslims to understand that don't let your deen restrict you to the confines of the masjid as we, as we began this podcast on speaking about. But at times we do feel like the deen 
suppresses us. Maybe it's by a, a lack of, of scholarship in terms of guiding the ummah in the right direction, or maybe it's a misunderstanding of the deen. What are your thoughts on the words of this uh, astronaut, <laughs> if, if we can call him that, and the fact that he was Muslim, and the fact that he's encouraging Muslims to use their faith to explore horizons as opposed to suppress them? So I, I think I'd approach this from a Quranic perspective in the sense that if you look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approaches the halal, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the earth, uh, you know, vast for you and it is halal and tayyib and, you know, seek from it what you want. And then the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say made haram are very, very few and very, very specific. So oftentimes we may have this perception that the deen is very restrictive, but it's the exact opposite. The deen is restrictive in those things that are harmful to you, mm -hmm. right? And if it's harmful to you, why do you want to pursue it anyways, right? So uh, the more you get to understand this deen and how it's based on uh, benefits and harms, that which is beneficial, Allah has made halal, that which is harmful to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram, then why would you feel restricted in that perspective, right? So it's only something that is haram that you would be restricted by, whereas everything else that is beneficial would be uh, permitted to you. Number two is I think there's often this disconnect where, you know, if you look at the scholars of the past, a lot of the famous ones were polymaths. And I think there's this expectation that all of our imams need to be like that as well. Where I think there's that fine line that yes, all imams and shuyukh need to expand their horizons and be familiar with it. But I think what's even greater is a collaborative approach. Where if I know fiqh and this person knows you know, science and math, why can't we not all work together to share ideas to come to a conclusion together, right? So all that to say that it's often unfair that we label our imams and shiuch uh, that, you know, they're archaic, they're medieval, they don't know anything. It's not their fault. This is where they went to school. This is what they that's learned. Their and that's their speciality. And this is how they're serving the ummah, mm. right? You can't expect them to know everything. Now, this is to say that, how are we investing in our imams in our shiuch? Like what massage do you know that have a stipend for their imams and their shiuch to learn and grow? that every year here's $3,000, go and take a class in public relations, go and skills. take a class in public speaking, go take a class in counseling. Which imams, uh, sorry, which masajid or community organizations offer this? Mm -hmm. They don't. So until we change our mindset, our imams and shiuch aren't gonna change. So I think there is that fine line uh, over there as well. Yeah, and so also about not undermining other people's talents and skills. Like sometimes we have this perception that the ideal Muslim is this character like a cookie cutter person. And if everyone just becomes like this cookie cutter individual, mm -hmm. then we'll have a grand and amazing ummah when it's not the case. There's, we there's, need different yeah, people. We do need different people. And if we were all the same, it would be quite a boring yeah. and plain and We world. shouldn't belittle anyone yeah. else. We should rather of course. utilize different people. We just had uh, Dr. Tarek Swaydan last week and he Mashallah. was actually asked by Yusuf Qardawi, one of you know the grand uh, scholars of, of our generation. Allah yirhamu, may Allah have mercy on him. And Yusuf Qardawi admitted that he didn't know anything about leadership mm. and he asked openly said that he well. asked Dr. Tarek Swaydan to teach me about leadership and don't just teach me he gathered all the mashaykh the grand mashaykh Sheikh Muhammad Adedo from Mauritania and all the grand mashaykh and he says Tarek Swaydan Dr. Tarek teach us about leadership Allahu Akbar so this is his speciality teach the ummah and each and every single one of us has that speciality or multiple specialities that we should build and and contribute. Allahu Akbar. You know, I, I, I think if you look at, just to go on a quick tangent, if you look at the scholars of the past, like uh, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, or Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari, rahimahullah, they all went through multiple phases in their life. And at the end, they all came to the conclusion that knowledge is which brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think people often forget that. We get so bogged down in studying the nitty-gritty details of aqidah and fiqh and any, and any other science. But if it's not bringing you closer to Allah, what is the point of it, right? So the person that's searching for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find Allah. So as long as you're sincere and you're on your journey to look for Allah, you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the key thing is, how do we know that we're sincere, right? And I think that's the thing that you have to keep struggling with, you know, constantly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sincerity, raising our hands to Allah, praying to Allah in the middle of the night and begging and pleading with Allah for the things that we want. That is the sign of sincerity. And I think a lot of us are falling short in that, right? We want to find Allah. We're claiming that we want Allah, but are we willing to put in that effort? And oftentimes we're not. 
So then why are we surprised when we're not getting the results, right? So I would say that is uh, probably my advice that whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. If you're not putting in the effort, don't expect miraculous results. Well, you're miracles right. happen, but not to everyone, mm. right? There's a reason why they're called miracles. So um, run towards Allah, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and pray and make a dua. Be sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll get everything that you want. Yeah. That's Charla. profound advice. You know, a lot of a lot of the times we get confused. We're so busy chasing after the asbab, the worldly means, and we forget Khaliqul Asbab, of course. the creator of the means. And always ask yourself, Am I becoming closer to am I coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Mm -hmm. I also want to throw one more confusing topic out to you. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the world being a place of being quote unquote cursed, but at the same time a place of great beauty. There's another issue when it comes to the deen that can also cause some confusion and conflicting ideas, uh, some cognitive dissonance among, amongst Muslims, and that is the issue of Islam being a religion of yusr, a religion of ease. So for instance, we see a plethora of Islamic literature saying that this deen is a deen of ease. The Quran speaks about this deen being a, a deen of ease. Allah wishes ease for you and not hardship. And everyone's favorite Instagram quote, after hardship comes yeah, ease. Yeah, <laughs> there's always ease. <laughs> but at the same time, we also see other hadith which are somewhat contrary. And of course, contrary to the, the surface level, that Jannah is surrounded by hardship and difficulty. And we see that, I think one of the, the foundations of fiqh is uh, the qawaid, the foundations of jurisprudence is that the greater the difficulty, the greater the reward. Mm -hmm. You will not enter Jannah until you be tested and trialed. And this creates somewhat of a cognitive dissonance amongst Muslims. Does Allah want ease or does Allah want hardship? Is Islam a deen, a religion of ease or is it a religion that you know necessitates hardship? How do we find that balance, the middle ground? So I'm going to turn this question back to you and then I'll answer it. Well, I'm not when, <laughs> when is ease a good thing? I think it comes back to what you were just saying before, when you're coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't I, know, I what, what happens to people when they have too much ease in their life? Complacent. That's Allah. Complacent, they forget Allah subhanahu wa yeah. ta'ala, you know, apathetic, lethargic, all these things happen Laziness, when they have too much comfort. The lazy generation today. So ease becomes something praiseworthy and beneficial in the face of hardship. Ease in and of itself is not something that is praiseworthy, right? So if you have constant ease, what is the value of that ease? It's not valuable at all. So this is why going back to Qawaid Fiqhiyah, there's two things that we'll look at. Uh, that necessities will be judged with regards to their greatness and their severity. Meaning that the ease that comes with necessity is based upon the level of that necessity. And then the ease that comes with it, that necessity brings about permissibility even in the impermissible, mm -hmm. right? So all that to say is that I think our deen is one of pragmatism in the sense that our deen will approach things from the lens of this is where you need um, discipline and you need to be strict and you need to focus like the five daily prayers. Even in war, you have to pray. You're not getting out of yeah, it, right? Yeah. That's where the discipline is needed. But the ease comes about, okay, if you need to combine and you need to shorten in certain circumstances, that's perfectly fine, right? So it's in accordance to the hardship that you're facing. And ease in of itself is not necessarily a good thing. And I think we need to get rid of that mindset that if you constantly have ease, it, it's terrible for you. It doesn't it build is, you. It doesn't build you, exactly. And there's so many other things that we could discuss with. No pain, no gain. Exactly, <laughs> right? These quotes are just like major throwback. Anyone gems, that was born gems, gems. in the 90s, yeah. I don't know, that's no, not that yeah. long ago. But So all, all yeah. of that to say, I think that's how I would approach the, the topic, that Islam is pragmatic, ease is praiseworthy in the face of hardship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the end of the day, is al-alim and al-hakim. And whatever he has dictated is what is best for us. Hmm. I have one personal question for you, Sheikh Naveed. You began this podcast with Rahimahullah, Dr. Muhammad al-Sharif. Someone I did not have the honor or the privilege to meet, unfortunately, but I benefited from his lectures, from his talks. He's someone who, I guess, embodied that balance between deen and dunya. Someone who was highly successful uh, financially, perhaps, but at the same time, someone who was well-rounded when it came to Islamic knowledge, his da'wah. And he attained that balance and he left behind a great legacy. What are some of the lessons you learned 
from Rahimahullah, Dr. Muhammad al-Sharif, and what made him so important to you? I know he had a profound role and, and relationship to you. What were some of the lessons he left you with? Rahimahullah. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very touchy subject because uh, there's a lot of funny incidents that happen, which uh, I'll, I'll share with you as uh, an introduction. But I, the person I get confused for the most is Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif. Allah. And I'll tell you a funny story. I was at Heathrow Airport. I'm sitting in the main like waiting area. And this brother comes up to me and he's like, MashaAllah, Sheikh, come in. You know, I'll take you inside the Qatar Airways business class lounge. Allah. And uh, he's like, I loved your program on Islam channel. And he's talking about something that Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif did. <laughs> Allah. So he's giving me all of this food and he's not letting me speak. Like he's just going on a, a mm. constant thing. He's preparing all this food. He's talking. He's telling me about all the things that he learned. And he never gave me the opportunity to, to tell him that I'm not Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif. And that's just one incident of the many, many incidents. I'm with it. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm living I'm it. Content. Living it up, right? Easy, remember? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Subhanallah. Quite literally, this is. <sighs> but you know, I I I don't know where to begin with the actual lessons. I I think, you know, number one is that Allah always deserves better. Like, what does that mean to us? Allah, Subhanahu wa Taala, always deserves better. That no matter what you do, you can still give a better effort, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is worthy of that effort. And this ties into so many other things that you will never be shortchanged by Allah, right? Like in this world, you can you work for an employer, you can put in multiple hours, your quality of work is phenomenal, they'll still pay you the exact same salary. That's it. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based upon your intentions and based upon your effort, your reward exponentially increases. Number two is the, the famous line that he had that if McDonald's can spend a billion dollars marketing a, a Big Mac, why can't we spend a million dollars, you know, marketing Islam? And I think that's what revolutionized Dawah in terms of making it more professional, right? Um, so I think that professional aspect of Dawah is so important where knowledge is revered, scholars are revered, and Islam as a whole is taken more seriously. And I think that is something that has been very, very profound. Number three is that you should never feel bad about being successful. Because people oftentimes, and this may not be a current thing, but at least back then, if an imam drove into the masjid driving a Ferrari, people would be like, what's going on? Is he a drug dealer on the mm, side? What's he doing? Yeah, exactly. What's right? happening to the masjid donations? But, you know, what if, mashallah, the imam has successful businesses? What if he does X, Y, and Z that's completely halal? We automatically think the worst, and therefore the imam feels bad for being successful, Right. And that shouldn't be the case. If you're successful, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't need to feel bad as long as you're not doing anything haram. So I think those are, are, are some of the, the biggest lessons um, that I'd share right off the top of my head uh, from Sheikh Muhammad rahimahullah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A legacy that's d deserving to be envious of in the halal sense. A hundred percent. hundred percent. SubhanAllah, if you look at Al-Maghrib Institute, like Sheikh Muhammad doesn't even... so. Just to give you some context, Sheikh Muhammad rahimahullah started off Al Maghrib Institute. He taught for maybe about 10 years and then he stepped away. He was just a figurehead president of Al Maghrib Institute. And then he started up Discover You, which was like Islamic self development, right? So even though he was a president of Al Maghrib, when he was no longer teaching, he didn't take a penny from it. That, that was his Sadaqah Jariya. And right now we've hit our 20 year anniversary, 200,000 active students. And bi idnillahi ta'ala, this is going on the mizan of his hasanat, inshallah ta'ala. Mm -hmm. And then he had his own business, you know, Discover You, which I think that one of itself was revolutionary, right? That Islamic self-help, right? We are just talking about how people want to thank the universe. Mm -hmm. And he's like, forget the universe, thank Allah thank subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Subhanahu. Use dua to get everything that you want, right? Mm -hmm. Forget, you know, whispers into the secrets of the universe and, you know, putting out positive vibes and that's what you'll get back. Raise your hands and beg and plead with Allah. That's what's gonna make you successful, right? And I think that in of itself was a, a huge contribution uh, to the Ummah, rahimahullah. Yeah, mashallah. Allahumma ja'alhu min ahl al-jannah. Ameen, Allah ya make him from the people of Jannah. And all of us, and all of us. Of course, Amin. And Allah, you unite us all. I mean, I mean, you know, this is uh, the, the silver lining that uh, when physical bodies, hearts and souls are apart, they have this moment that they keep looking forward to where they'll be united again, right? So we have 
you know, inna mawidun al Jannah, that our next appointment, our next meeting, is in Jannah bi Taala. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Inshallah, makes the heart grow fonder, as they say. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Subhanallah. A bittersweet ending, um, but as we say, um, oh, as the people, as uh, anyway, Subhanallah. I'm actually really taken back. It's sometimes you can say these things, but then to actually live through that experience, to say to absence makes them. the heart grow stronger. Subhanallah. It really, it really hits you very hard. Amen. Subhanallah. May we all be people of benefit, inshallah. Amen, ya Rab. And it's the simple things. A smile is an act of charity. Allahu Akbar. We don't know how many people are going through so many things in their life, but if you were to look at one person and have a smile on your face, you don't know so how much impact it could have. Allah. It really yeah. is the simple things. Religion is not a thing that's so overwhelming. Of course, we have a vast history, but it's always the small things that are overlooked. So I would really emphasize that. There is no, I guess, disparity. There's no disconnect between being a person who is of deen and a person who is of dunya. dunya. So as long as you have that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you remain close to Allah. Shall we conclude on this hadith then? Bismillah. Let's conclude yep. on this hadith. There's a group of poor companions that are living inside of the masjid and they come complaining to the Prophet ﷺ, and they say, Ya Rasulullah, ذَهَبَ أَهْلُ الدُّثُورِ بِالْأُجُورِ The rich companions amongst us, they've run away with all the reward. They pray just like we pray, they fast like just like we fast, but they give in sadaqah that which we cannot give. Teach us something if we were to do it, it would put us at par with them. And in the version in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ teaches them to say SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 33 times. And no one will come better than you on the day of judgment except the one that did this and more. Some time goes by and these poor companions come back and they say, Ya Rasulullah, the rich companions found out our secret. Teach us something more. <laughs> so what we learn from this is that the ideal case scenario is that the believer is perfecting their personal ibadah, meaning that they're praying, they're fasting, doing all those uh, acts of personal ibadah. Number two, they have iman and taqwa. And number three, they're blessed with a lot of wealth. That is the ideal case scenario, right? That's not a scenario that everyone will have, but that is the ideal case scenario that you're doing your personal ibadah, you're a person, a person that is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has iman and taqwa, and that Allah has blessed you with a lot of wealth. And then the Prophet says, That is a favor of Allah, Allah that He selectively gives to whomever He pleases. Allah, Allah. What a perfect way to end this conversation. We could go on for hours. I think it's yeah. quite clear, Sheikh. It's been an absolute honor to have you on. Uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us and wish you uh, a good recovery journey because I don't know if people can't tell at home is that you've actually just landed like less than 24 hours ago. Yes. Yeah, so subhanAllah, you came energized and subhan, we could tell it really fed through the conversation. So. Allah Allah I was Allah really you. excited to be here. Like I cannot tell you how excited I am to be Allah. here. Jazakallah khairan for having me. Thank the you so glow much. is clear, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan to all our viewers at home. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. You can also find our podcast on all platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And if you had any suggestions that you'd like to hear on future episodes, please do let us know in the comment section, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.